Hi, we're from the St. Croix River Education District. I'm Nick. I'm Courtney. And I'm Rye. And generally in education, we talk about um, framing things positively and talking about what we're going to do and what we're not going to do. In this video, we are actually just talking about what we try not to do. Um, and it's kind of a list of when we are responding to undesired student behavior, things we don't want to see happen, um, things that we, bad habits we can find ourselves in that aren't productive. And we just want to acknowledge at the beginning of the video, like it's frustrating. Um, like it's understandable why why people fall into these habits or, or just do them one time. Um, we deal with really difficult situations in the context of really difficult jobs. Um, so it, it makes perfect sense. It's just we're coming at it from the lens of just practicality, pragmatically, like how are we gonna set ourselves up to keep the situation as small as possible and make sure that it's less likely to happen again? Because just in the long term, we want to have less of that undesired behavior. So without further ado, we're gonna kind of run down a list of things that we try not to do when we're in those situations addressing undesired student behavior. Uh, raising my voice, scowling, and other aggressive um, voice tone volume or, or nonverbal posturing. Um, I know sometimes, many times, I've been in situations where um, there's ongoing undesired behavior. I worked in a federal setting for a special education program for a couple of years. Um, you're going to be frustrated. Uh, you're going to have that impulse to raise your voice or, or to scowl. Um, and it, it's really difficult to use your own impulse control and your brake system to keep yourself from doing that. I don't know if you or Rye or Courtney have had similar experiences. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> I think it just happens. I think it happens all the time. And I think we've all encountered stuff like that. And it, it is just really tricky. And sometimes it's even hard to catch yourself doing it. And I sometimes wouldn't even notice that I was until I got some different verbal or nonverbal communication from the student I was talking to, like reflecting, hey, oh, maybe I didn't handle that quite well. And I think what we talk about, like, we want to be the calm one in the interaction. And if we're not feeling that way, it's just we, we try and give that impression because um, we want to be the ones who are calm and in control or else we add fuel to the fire and the fire gets bigger. Um, kind of similar, and this one is a lot easier said than done, is not taking the students disrespectful comments personally. Um, and in trainings that the three of us do, we talk about thresholds a lot. Um, everybody has different thresholds. So a lot of things, um, and I've heard some students say incredibly disrespectful things to me that I can't repeat um, in this video. Uh, a lot of them are easy to shrug off. Like I just, they don't make logical sense. They're ridiculous. I just know the student's trying to get under my skin. Um, it's it's really easy to not take them personally, but e like even I have had comments about things that are relevant to family members that I care about, like things they're struggling with. Student has no idea. They're just talking about something um, and it's it's tough to to not take that personally. Um, so being conscious of your uh, your thresholds and the things that trigger you is important. And just depending on the school you're in, um, the students you're working with, what your role is. Uh, you might have the ability to, to tap out um, and just if you have that ability, doing that is important. If you do get triggered and you notice like I'm, I'm really taking this personally, I'm not going to be productive and helpful right now. Um, One thing Ryan and I talk about sometimes in our trainings is using our Q-tips. So quit taking it personally. Mm -hmm. Just making sure that we keep that in, in mind because the students generally aren't trying to to make us feel bad or do things that are negative to us specifically. They just are feeling what they're feeling and that's how they're expressing it. Um, engaging in power struggles. And we hear that phrase a lot. Um, it's, it's really like an easy one to get sucked into is if a student says like, well, this work is stupid or this sucks. Like, why are we doing this? Um, and allowing yourself to get drawn into that and getting into an argument maybe in front of a bunch of other students about why the, the work is important is one example. Like we talk in another video about how important it is to kind of proactively talk about why the curriculum is relevant. So you're less likely to get pulled into that very common power struggle. But I mean, really essentially like school in order to follow a routine as a whole group 
and get work done, you have to follow instructions. So that's kind of a core tenant of why we're doing things. So if I get challenged in that way and, and it's I don't want to get into that ongoing conversation arguing about why the curriculum import is important, we're doing this next transition or this next activity because I'm the instructor and the adult and it's what we're going to do. Um, and I would not disrespectfully, but keep coming back to that because that's that's what's happening. It's not a power struggle. It's just I'm the one who is the leader who is going to decide what we're doing next. Um, threatening punishments, uh, which are vague, impassioned, um, like uh, quit soon or you'll be sorry, um, yeah, or you're going to lose something if you keep doing this, kind of those like vague, like I'm mad, I don't know exactly what I'm going to do, but I'm going to do something. Again, really understandable and easy to fall into this one because it just, it happens. You're not prepared, maybe. Like something happens and you're just like, well, how am I supposed to deal with this? Um, and you're just like, well, you, you got to stop or I'm going to figure out what I'm going to do later. Um, so thinking through your classroom management plan and the behaviors that you're going to encounter, like in some schools where they define major behaviors and minor behaviors or, or minor, moderate and major, like that can bring a lot of calm to those situations. It really can. Like, what is my threshold for um, like pulling a student out to the hallway and having a conversation? What's my threshold for just doing the look? Um, for proximity, what's my threshold for when I would do an out-of-classroom referral? Um, having all of that planned out so that it's kind of a system for you um, can bring calm so you know you're prepared to respond to a lot of different things versus having to like improv. I also think it's important to let students know those thresholds and not keep them like secret. Like this is our expectation. When you reach this, this is what happens because the more they know what's coming and that you are gonna follow through with what you say, the more likely they are to follow those instructions. Yeah, that consistency is really important um, and that communication and both of those things like communicating that proactively and then being consistent with it student to student as well. And you might think like, well, if I tell the students those are like, that's what I'm going to do, then they're just going to like play the system um, and do it. And that's where all the other things we do to have students engaged and, and welcome in our class play a role. But just overall, predictability is really important for students. They're not going to feel as as safe and not going to have as good of a relationship with you that's far less likely if you're really unpredictable, if you're an unpredictable force in their lives and you're going to respond very differently the one day to something that you respond very differently to the other day. Um, One-sided lecturing. <laughs> um, and when we're really frustrated and we have a lot to say um, about what a student just said or what they did, or if yeah, for meeting with them one-on-one -on -one after the fact, this can be an easy trap to fall into. Um, what, what happens though, is the student tends to become very passive. Again, we're thinking like practically, we want the student to learn that they made a mistake and not to repeat it. So if we only communicate one way and tell them like endlessly in a lecture, this is why this is wrong, this affected me, this was bad, this is disrespectful, and just keep saying that, student can just tune us out. <laughs> We're not asking for any interaction with them. They can just kind of nod their head. They just want to get through that experience um, as easily as possible, and they don't want to learn from it. So we, we have to, it's harder, it's a lot harder, but we have to give them that invitation to participate, um, or else, like I said, they're just going to tune us out. Um, so talking about like, you know, this happened. Can you tell me about why you made that decision? Um, inviting them to have a dialogue with us versus just that lecturing. Um, mocking sarcasm or making jokes jokes at the student's expense. Um, so, uh, like, stop acting like a brat um, is one you might have heard. Um, or, wow, you're really being mature about this, kind of that sarcastic tone. Again, <laughs> We can't echo this enough. Being an educator is a very difficult job. Um, on particular days, it's almost impossible. So you are going to be very frustrated. Um, being the calm, collected, in control, bigger person adult is going to feel like a monumental task in certain moments and in certain days. Um, but if I were to respond with that sarcasm, 
I'm not setting myself up in the future to be seen as a calm, collected, mature adult. I'm kind of falling to that level of just being aggressive and, and immature in that moment. I get, you know, the context, but um, it's not setting me self, myself up for success later, nor the student. I think um, sometimes our students, like, especially the older ones, they get sarcasm and sometimes they're sarcastic and in the right moment, it can be fun and it can help build that relationship. But when it gets to this point, it's definitely something you want to avoid. Mm -hmm. um, minimalizing the student's issue. Um, so sometimes, in many cases, students are having a difficult time or being disruptive for a reason that as a mature experienced adult, we think is a little bit ridiculous. Um, so a pencil broke or um, the sports got canceled after school or a field trip in a couple days got canceled. Uh, these things where we with our adult perspective are like, it's not a big deal. Um, if, if we verbalize that, it, it, again, it's just not setting ourselves up for success. Um, we can we can talk the student through that when they're calm, but particularly particularly if they're upset, it's a big deal to them, and that's what it comes down to. Um, so, bringing that student down and helping them calm down, and later kind of gently helping them realize, like, yeah, you know, this this is too bad. I I I know that you feel sad about it, or I know you feel anxious, or whatever they're feeling, um, but how are we gonna how are we gonna get past it? And kind of coaching them through that is a better way to play it than kind of in just downplaying and dismissing. Because again, in that moment, it's a big deal to them. And that's really what matters. Um, using presumptive phrases is one that we don't often think of. Um, but telling a student, I understand how you feel. For some students in some situations, that's, that's going to be fine. And they're really going to appreciate that. So don't think like we're telling you, like, just never, ever say the phrase, I understand how you feel. But if you just think about it, um, we often talk to students, and we talk about this in another video, where we listen to them, we think we get it, and we really missed the point. Um, so just a quick little modification to that phrase that I often use is like, hey, I think I get it. Like, it sounds like you're feeling angry about this, or some, yeah, something like that. And I'll just say like, hey, is that right? Um, and that's a way of saying the same thing, but it gives the student an out to correct you. And it's just a simple little tweak um, that in many cases, students have jumped in and said, oh, no, that's that's not really it. Like, you missed it. Um, and if my objective is to hear a student out and have them feel like I get them so they don't have to keep repeating or finding other ways to tell me why they're upset or why they're feeling a certain way, um, that's what I want to accomplish. And, you know, again, not just saying I understand how you feel, but saying like, hey, I think I get it. Like, is this it? Um, is a different way of doing that. All right, thank you for your time. Have a good one, guys.